Hello, everyone, and welcome to Behind Massive Screens, a game development podcast here from Massive Entertainment. Maybe a little known fact for people listening. I used to work as a community developer for the Division franchise back in the day, a couple of years ago, and almost roughly... A couple of years ago. A couple of years ago. It's been a couple of years. Almost every week, roughly every week on our Twitch stream, I got to say two words, and I'm really happy today to get to say them again. Hey, Yannick. <laughs> yes. 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 Yannick Bancherow, creative director for The Division 2. Welcome. Thank you. How are you happy doing? Happy to be here. Good, uh-huh. good. It's like, uh, as I said, it's uh, getting back into routine mode of recording things and talking and talking about the game. It's, uh, yeah, haven't flexed those muscles in a while. Yeah, so it's, it's been... uh, yeah, it's going to be fun. Yep. You actually said before recording, total transparency, you were on stage earlier today. You said this was more intimidating. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's just, uh, you know, I find it even more intimidating than state of the game because state of the game, you have a camera, you know, yeah. you know, you know where your audience is. It's just, we are just talking in an empty room and like I'm talking to you, but I know other people are listening. So it's, uh, yeah. I don't get the live reaction. I'm not the intimidating one, right? Nah, nah, no, nah, no, nah, no, nah, no, 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 no. You know, that's never been the dynamic between us. No, you're Who's the intimidating, you're, you're one? The intimidating one. That's true. Uh, but let's jump into the regular part of the program. Okay. Uh, we're you here. mean this is not about just us reflecting on the past? No, and... it's not one of those nostalgic, oh, right. really Good. boring one. Like two people maybe out there find it interesting. <laughs> Back in the and days. That's, that's you and me. You remember. You remember. The... Anyway, the first question I usually ask people, huh? you're here as creative director yes on a top level what does a creative director do because that's probably one of those questions a lot of people have yeah uh, i have that question too so um give you (laughs) my version of what i do uh but it's uh, on a game like you know the division which is the game i work on it's uh it's very much about you know having the highest possible vision on where the game needs to go, what right. needs to happen with the game. Uh, so we look at we look at content, we look at story, we look at all aspects of the game, and try to uh, try to be the guiding light for the entire team of you know knowing where this is going, what needs to happen, what needs to change. Even though we don't necessarily, or I don't necessarily provide the solutions, but I'm here to ask the right questions to the team and like, right. give them the direction on this is, these are the the topics that you need to focus on because this is the need that we have on the game. Right. Uh, so it's, uh, yeah, it's a lot about looking at the game we have and how do we make it better and in which direction, there are many directions you can make it better. So prioritizing which directions do we want to go first. Right. We'll get back to the, the whole team thing uh, yep. later on. Uh, but before that, also the typical question we ask: How did you end up at Massive Entertainment and as creative director? Uh, so, yeah, I um, so I joined Massive seven years ago. Actually, this month it's been seven years. I joined in March 2015, so uh, one year before we shipped Division One. Uh, so I had a, before prior to Massive, I've uh, I've had you know I've been in the industry for like 15 years. I worked in a, a always customer relationship. I was customer support uh, at the beginning or back in the old days. We used to call it game mastering, like in the <laughs> MMO days. Uh, and uh, and then from their community management. And uh, and one day I was just, you know, contacted for, uh, uh, for a job here at Massive as community developer on the division, which I knew of because as everybody else, mm-hmm. I had seen the trailers and, and the whole hype. And I was like, yeah, division, that, yeah, that sounds good. Uh, and uh, so I came here as a community developer for Division 1 before we launched the game. Uh, launched that game, got to do a bunch of fun things uh, as a community developer. And then when Division 2 uh, was uh, was on the way, uh, I, you know, I felt like I had reached or done the things I could do as a community developer. And it was time for me to, uh, to try to do something else. Uh, so I... Uh, I worked with, you know, with our, our core team, as we call it, with our creative director back then, Julian Geraiti, uh, on uh, trying to identify where I could fit uh, and, and what could be a good direction for me. And, uh, and I was very interested with, you know, the problematics of content and mm-hmm. like, the game. And even as a community developer, I also already worked a bit on that as trying to be the voice of the community. Uh, so this is something I was interested to explore. Uh, so anyway, from, from there on, we, uh, yeah, he mentored me and helped me a lot, uh, and uh, and I 
you know, found a place first in a live team as live content manager. So we're really focusing on updates and what's the content that goes in the updates in what order and uh, uh, when do we release it and, and all of that. And uh, and then eventually for Warlords of New York, um, became an associate creative director to help uh, to help Julian on some aspects of Warlords of New York, especially seasonality and uh, and all those things. And then after that, I uh, yeah ended up on my own. Yeah. Running the thing. <laughs> Running the thing. And we're going to talk about the thing soon. <laughs> the thing. The thing. Um, but uh, for starting out, let's start somewhere in this, this jungle of, of topics. Yeah. Um, we, you have new stuff coming. Yep. Um, yes, we do. Either very soon or it just arrived. It depends on <laughs> when this goes out. Yeah. Who knows? Uh, but how do you, after a, a, a while, it, it, it's been a while since we've seen new content for The Division 2. Like, how do you approach creating new content from scratch, especially from, from your angle? Yeah, I think it's, um, you know, you. the cool thing with, running, uh, with working on a live game is that you have, you have a base product. Mm -hmm. So it's all about... What does it provide? What does it lack? Uh, what is working? What is not working? Uh, so it's constantly evaluating, you know, the strengths and weaknesses of of the game, uh, and trying to fill the gaps. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so when we look at making new content, we are asking ourselves, what does the community want? What's what are the experiences that the game currently doesn't provide and could provide? What are the uh, the experiences that exist, but we think we could make better. Uh, so it's looking at all of that and then, you know, comparing that with what team do we have? Uh, what resources do we have? How much time do we have? Because, mm. you know, if it were up to me, we would do all the things. <laughs> of uh, course. But, uh, but there's a limit in how much we can do and in how sure. much time. So, uh, so it's a constant work of uh, looking at, you know, having that idea of here are all the things that the game needs but then what pieces fit in, you know, uh, which parts of the puzzle because mm -hmm. of the constraints. Uh, so, uh, and from update to update, we may have a different direction. You know, there are updates where we want to prioritize specific areas. So we're going to focus our efforts on different elements that fit in one theme. And mm -hmm. then another update, it can be something else or over an entire year of content or so yep. you can spend a year being like, okay, the focus on this year is going to be one topic. And every, every change we make, every piece we add is related to that topic. Uh, so it's really, uh, yeah, it's really just about constantly looking at what needs to, uh, what needs to be improved, what needs to be added, and then prioritizing everything. It's just right. my work is always just prioritizing things over others. Yeah. So, you know, heart crushing decisions all the time. Yeah, I was, I, I was about to ask how those, those priorities are made. Like, yeah, it's, I mean, there's many, uh, many aspects. There's a, uh, you know, it's always at the end of the day, it's always how much time and effort do we put on it and mm -hmm. what do we get out of it? Yep. And uh, and there are things that we, we are really attached to and we would love to do, but when we look at how much time it would take and what would we actually get out of it, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's just not worth it or not worth over something else. Right. Uh, whereas other things might, you know, take just as much time but have a way bigger impact. Yep. So, uh so that's how priorities go. It's just uh, constantly looking at uh, looking at here. Um, here are my set. Here's my set of uh, data. Here's my set of like the people, the time um, that I have, the, the feedback from the community, and this is all the information I have. Now, what do I what do I leverage that with? What do I what do I make out of that? And there's three hundred different things I could do. Yeah. So which one fits best? Which one is the best use of this time? Yeah. And that's the very special part of running a live game as well, I guess. Yeah, I think it's very different. And uh, if you would ask a creative director working on a, you know, on an unreleased game, uh, it's a very different work. And I cannot talk about that because I, uh, I have seen it, but I haven't done it myself. <laughs> so, uh, so I wouldn't want to try to uh, uh, pretend that it's the same job. It's very different. Yeah. But uh, but running a live game, it's it is that. It is about, and that's. That's the good thing about it as well, and that's why I love doing what I do. Is just you can always make it better. Yeah, you can always make it better, and it's never too late. Yeah. You know, you you can you can make mistakes when you're running a live game because you will always have an opportunity to come back and revisit and fix yeah. uh, and improve and iterate. So uh, so you take things you know one at a time um, or 
you know, several timelines. You try to look at short term, mid term, long term, look at what fits where, uh, make assumptions, take the data, make all those decisions, and then you put it out there and either it works, that's great, it doesn't work, it's not the end of the world, we can always come back and revisit it. Yeah, yeah, that, that was always the exciting part, and I guess it, it very much is for you, like things change all the time, mm. both uh, bo both as working on the inside, but also as a player, watching the, the live games that I, I personally play the most, like yeah. watching the evolution constantly and the, and the changes. Yeah, it's always, you know, it's, it's a big set of Lego, so you just, yeah. you move the pieces all the time, and then you rebuild it, and then you dismantle it and rebuild it again, and it's just, uh, it's always moving, it's always changing. Yeah. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, every live game has that thing on, in common that the older they get, the, just the better they are. Yeah. Because that's what you do when you run a live game. You just make it better and better. Yeah. So what, can you kind of, I think it's actually wrapped up in everything you've talked about now, but like the main challenge of running a live game, what would you say that is? It's, uh, I think the main challenge is trying to reconcile what the players want and what we can do. Mm -hmm. uh, because a big part of the priorities is also community feedback and community wants, but but there are things we just can't do, or there are things that are just not, uh, really not the best investment mm -hmm. for us. Uh, and sometimes it can be a good one because just, you know, doing something that is for the community can pay off big time, but it's not always the case. Um, and I think that's the hardest part with running a live game is that the players want something like, you know, every player has an idea of how they want the game to be. And you need to take that and translate that into insights and then compare with what you can do, what you think the game needs. Sometimes it goes together, it marries really well, and that's great. Sometimes it doesn't, and you have to make a decision between one or the other. Yeah. And that's the that's the toughest part because a lot of those decisions are also based on um, you know constraints and uh, and requirements that you just cannot explain. Right. Uh, of course. You know, of course, we're not going to go out there and talk about budget, talk about resources, and talk about all the the actual um, the actual conditions under which the game is made uh, because that's that's also never a good justification to tell the players, hey, we can't do that right. thing because we don't have the money or whatever. Right. Not that it happens a lot, but it's just, uh, it's always you need to make those decisions and sometimes you can explain them, sometimes you can't. So you're going to have to live with the fact that you're disappointing people um, yeah. and uh, and there's nothing you can do about it. But therefore, as I said, you can always maybe come back later, revisit that or, you know, satisfy them on other areas. Yeah, yeah I was supposed to say, you, you don't always know exactly what you want. Mm -hmm. And then you get something completely different. It's like, wow. Yeah, and that's also part of the job. It's, uh, you know, I said we, we need to translate player feedback into insights, but sometimes there's also things that, um, yeah, you need to look at what can we do that they cannot think of. Because very often when you, you know, all of us, when we think of a, a product and when we think of how to make a product better, we we always think of it in the frame of, what that thing is. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to step outside of the box and think of think of a new idea. You know, it's always the thing like try to imagine a new color. You can't imagine a new color. Yeah. Uh, and it, it's kind of the same here. It's like when you ask someone to take a game and say, how would you make it better? They would very often think of it in the context of what this game is and what this game has. Sure. Uh, and our job is also to try to step out of that, of that and think of what are new ideas, new things we could do uh, that would actually also uh, satisfy the players or answer some of the needs in new creative ways. That also means taking risk because yeah. you never know until it's out if it's actually going to pay off or not. Of course. So you have a bunch, <laughs> a bunch of different things here. Uh, before, uh, I really want to talk about, about the how a creative director, you and your role as a creative director for this particular project, work with your team. But I just want to touch really before we kind of lose that touch. Um, the community angle here is, mm. of course, really, really interesting. You worked as a community developer for a long time. Like, how do you bring that background with you into all the stuff that we were talking about now? Yeah, it's, I think that's, that's something that I've, that I try to leverage mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, and turn into a strength. Uh, I think with all my years working in community, I have a pretty good grasp and understanding of, player wants and player needs and mm. every time every time we work on a game even today I still always try to look at everything from a player angle 
I always try to put myself in the in the shoes of the player. So as I said earlier, there are reasons why we are making the decisions we're making, but I'm always trying to look at it at, as, yeah, but all those reasons are things that, you know, someone who plays the game will not know. Right. So all we all the player will judge is the end result, yeah. not the, the way there. Uh, so I try to always look at it that way and I try to always bring in that angle. Um, and uh, that doesn't mean I, you know, all the decisions I make are driven by that, but it's, uh, I try to be conscious of it all the time. Yeah. Uh, and of course, community is something that is very dear to me. It's a big part of my career. It's a passion of mine. So, uh, so it's also always a bit of an experiment as well of like, keep learning actually a lot of community dynamics through that job, yeah. because now I get to, it's very different when you're the community developer and you talk to the team and you say, you should do that and not be the guy that actually makes the decision. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And I have a community developer in me that tells me, hey, you should do that. But then I'm like, yeah, but actually I can't. And that's terrible because <laughs> I want to argue against myself. Uh, it's not always negative, but it's, no, uh, no, no, yeah, no, no. it's, um, it's something I bring with me and I, I will carry with me, carry with me all the time. Yeah. So going, jumping from that to your, your team, how do mm -hmm. you work? Again, uh, we're, we're always talking from the perspective of, of your job. Yep. Like, how do you work with your the overall, the Division Two team? Well, uh, you know, I I like to think that um, there's probably very different approaches. You can uh, you can do that, but mm -hmm. um, I don't want the relationship with the team to be completely top-down. Like, I'm telling you what to do. Right. I know better than you do. Uh, the way I like to uh, to work with the team is I, I present challenges, I present questions, and I, you know, ask them to give me solutions um, and uh, and be creative in the way they're going to uh, to solve those problems uh, so it's really uh, it's really a work of gathering the best ideas and the best that comes out of everyone and then between all the options that this creates then pick the one that I think is the best yeah um, so uh, so that's a lot of the work that we do we iterate a lot with the team um, we would take something we we work on it we look at it and then we all discuss together okay how do we make it better? Uh, what can we what can we improve? What are the areas that work and don't work? Um, so it's uh, you know it's a uh, it's a good thing, especially in the when you look at the division team today, uh, which is a smaller team than what it used to be. Uh, it actually gives us a lot of um, flexibility and dynamic mm -hmm. in doing things like that because we can we can have a meeting with every person involved on the feature yeah. and discuss it all together and brainstorm. That's fine. You can't do that when you have tons of people working <laughs> right. because you have a much more, you, you must have a much more vertical structure. Of course. So, you know, uh, I would imagine, again, I haven't been in that experience, but it's harder for a creative director to sit with the team, the entire team and discuss solutions. Uh, when you have a team that is gigantic, that is sitting in a bunch of different areas and where there's a lot of layers of approval in between, yeah. we can do that uh, on the division. We can do that and we do that all the time. Yeah. Uh, so it's, uh, I think that gives us a lot of agility and flexibility in, um, in you know, reacting to new challenges and finding solutions. Yeah. I mean, there, there, there are, of course, pros and cons with everything, but, but what I, I kind of, and, and not saying anything bad about having like hundreds and hundreds of people oh, working I mean, on a project but it just sounds with a small team like that it just sounds fun it is i mean it's except there of course there are challenges there's a, there's, there's I mean, fun and less fun in both ways right but sure. it's uh it's fun because everybody knows each other and everybody you know gets their hands dirty like when yeah. there's a problem like everybody jumps in because we don't have we don't have the person to fix the problem. Right. Uh, you know, when you have hundreds of people, everybody's a specialist of something. Yep. And everybody is in charge of that one thing. Uh, when you're in a smaller structure, uh, that one thing, well, someone will have to jump it and do it, but they're probably not specialists at it, so they will have to learn. So I think it's a great opportunity for people to learn a bunch of things. And right. I'm learning a lot uh, because I'm also doing a lot of things that are probably not on the job description. <laughs> um, and everybody does in the team. Uh, and you need that mindset yeah. to be successful in this context. So that that is creative, that is fun, that is uh, that is very dynamic. Of course, sometimes it can be a problem as well because if you don't have the person to do the thing and nobody knows how to do it, you have to find out how to do it. Sure. And uh, and that can make some things much slower than they would be when you have you know many more people because uh, 
Because again, when you have a lot of people, everybody everybody has a place. Yep. The whole machine works because everybody uh, everybody does their job. Um, so it's a uh, it's know, a trade off. Really. It's a, it it is a trade off. Uh, but I you know I really enjoy it. I think uh, we have a really good team and we have a good relationship. So uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, you know keep working with them. Yep. Let's actually uh, move over a little bit to what you've been working on. As you said before, either the update has either arrived or will be out very soon, we'll see. depending on, again, when this is published. Um, but let, let's talk about the update itself. Yes. Um, so going still sticking to kind of the, the, the more philosophical angle yep. for a moment, like coming towards T15, what was like, what was it you wanted to accomplish? What was the philosophy behind the update? Well, it's T15 is a very specific beast because you know the context is that it comes after over a year mm. of no content for the game, right? Uh, so, but it's also something that is built by a brand new team. Mm. Uh, so when we approach it, it's not just a question of what do we need to uh, you know to make an impact so the players notice us and come back. Uh, it's also a question of how do we make that a learning experience for the new team, mm -hmm. uh, and how do we use that to try to uh, try to have them learn all the things they need to know, so then we can keep going. Because if you put all your eggs in that basket of TU15 and say we're going to make that as big as we can, um, and you don't think about the future, cool, you ship it, it's good, it's big. Uh, but if the team hasn't made the right learnings and if you haven't prepared properly, then you ship it, and then you're like. Okay, what do we do now? Mm -hmm. We start over again. Yeah, uh, that's not the way we wanted to approach it. We wanted to approach that in what is the best way to create something and in the same time make that a learning experience. So it's it's a good investment for the future because we are uh, building a team for here to stay yeah. uh, and not for you know to change it after after a few months. So um, so that's how we we try to approach it. So you know the idea of like let's make a new game mode. Game mode is a good way to for a team to learn because it's a uh, it's an isolated experience. So if you break it, you break the game mode. Yep. You don't break the game. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if, you start, if you start uh, asking the team to go touch complex things yeah. uh, that touch the whole game, if a mistake is made, the whole game can fall apart. Yeah. Uh, so the game mode is a good way, for example, to uh, for them to start playing around and, and touch a bunch of things. You know, uh, when you look at our game mode, there's a there's combat, there's AI, there's difficulty, there's a, there's level design, there's art, there's there's everything um, that uh, that a team requires to learn to be able to work on the division, but contained in an isolated experience. Right. So that's one thing that uh, that, for example, was very clear for us of like, okay, that's where we marry learning and creating something cool for the players. Yeah. And then there's other aspects. Uh, we look at we look at where the game is and and what it needs. And one example I can take is uh, expertise mm -hmm. and the addition of expertise. Uh, when we um, when we released title update twelve, uh, I know the naming convention is uh, is odd, but when we released title update twelve, uh, which was the one that came with season four at the end of twenty twenty. Okay, I yeah. don't keep track <laughs> of years anymore. Um, uh, you know, this was supposed to be our last update. We, yeah. We've communicated that. And uh, and it came with one feature because it was supposed to be our last update. We put optimization in there mm -hmm. because it was the idea of like, okay, let's, as a final send-off, let's give a way for all players to max out their gear. Yeah. Let's let's allow everyone to uh, become min-max. Yeah. Uh, so, so they can end at their own pace. Yeah. This was a feature in the first game as well. Yeah, optimization yeah. was a... Uh, it's a bit of a different implementation, but the idea sure, sure. came from the first game, yeah. And um, so, so we did that. But then, of course, uh, we are not stopping. We continue. Uh, we, we are, you know, we we decide to uh, to keep going. Uh, so, but now we have a game where everybody can be min max. So now we start thinking, okay, now we need a new progression. Right. We need a new chase. We need a new thing um, that's going to allow some players to stand out. Uh, and that's, you know, as part of my job, for example, this is me going to the team and saying, okay, we have optimization, everybody can max out their gear, so we need a new progression system, we need mm -hmm. a new chase, we need a new way for people to become more powerful. And I present that problematic, and then the team can think about it 
and provide uh, provide solutions and ideas and that's where expertise was born for example as a um a new thing that would be a kind of a new driver uh and a new way to uh uh to uh, yeah for players to, to progress and gain power right. uh, so that's that's also an example of that and there's also the idea of looking at you know when you when you make a live game um one win, one mistake that can be made is to always try to come up with new things uh and always add new things on top uh but you have a you have a pool you have a gold mine of existing things yeah uh, and some of them are super underused and it's always much cheaper very <laughs> often much cheaper in terms of time and resources and right. uh, and all that and investment to take something existing and make it better yep. rather than creating something new uh in the context of uh t15 even though now we uh uh we've announced that we're uh, we're delaying that but the specializations revamp is one example of that it's this was a core feature of division two when it launched um but it never really was used the way we wanted it to yeah. uh, so this is an opportunity for us again thinking of new team um the time we have like how can we have something that makes a big impact um, that touches a core mechanic uh, of the game, uh, but that doesn't require us to reinvent something completely new. Right. And it's just a, an improvement exercise on yeah. something existing. And that's where we do specialization, uh, specialization revamp. So uh, so yeah, it, it, it's a lot of different problematics and there's many other things we could have done, uh, but this is, you know, these are the, the main areas we decided to focus on another area um, that maybe we're going to talk about his story. Yeah. Um, and uh, we know that there is a there's a big attachment to story in our game. Um, and uh, in the past, uh, after Warlords of New York, we've been delivering stories story through seasons. Mm -hmm. um, but and we had we have big ambitions with uh, with where the story is going. But seasons is uh, it's limited in how much story you can give through the the existing implementation. So that's also a focus we made on yeah. uh, how do we how do we improve that? Um, because we want players when they come back to the game, we want we want the game to immediately feel alive. Like there is something going on. There's a story. So there's that's also a reason for me to come back. It's not just about mechanics and grind. It's also because there's a compelling call to action, and right. I need to answer it. Yeah, yeah. We we the story is on the list. Yeah. Let's, let's <laughs> get back to that topic soon. I thought we just we would talk a little bit more about the new game mode countdown um what was the what's the approach can you tell us about about uh countdown what you wanted to accomplish with it because it's been on the pds now for a while uh people have been playing it now it's either live or it's soon going live <laughs> uh when you you created countdown what was the idea behind it yes the idea with countdown is you know we try to look at when we do game modes we try to uh to think of what what place does it does it feel what 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 uh, experience does it create? Uh, because if it's just to create a game mode that is redoing something that another one does, again that's the same problem of creating something new when you could just improve the uh, the original. Um, and uh, uh, so we scan down what what we identified as something that could be interesting to do is kind of immediate short session intense action yep. um the idea was let's have a mode that is not a grind mode it's not something you're going to be playing for hours and hours and hours you can but it's not the intention here let's have something something that is quick fast-paced palette cleanser in between two activities mm. or when i log in i don't really know what to do yet i can do a quick countdown right uh to get in the mood you know to to warm up and then I can decide what I'm going to actually invest the rest of my time with. Yeah. Or I finish an activity and uh, yeah, I just need a quick action to uh, to get the whatever, the adrenaline or something. Uh, I'm gonna play a uh, countdown. Um, so it's really that uh, that immediate jump, uh, eight players, 15 minutes, intense PvE, um, jump in, do the thing. As I said, super intense all the way to the end, uh, get rewards for it and then move on and do something else yeah no we were talking about it uh earlier today the, the thing that pops up into my head for for the division veterans is resistance in the first game because that kind of worked similar for me in that way like okay i have i don't know what to do or i have x amount to play let let's go let's do that adrenaline high 
and then the stew would either and go do something else yeah. or or uh, do it again because the there's different ways you can approach it and resistance for example uh, you can decide to um to have a short session as you said in turns action uh or you can decide to invest long term uh into it and spend some time because you have the you know the, the yeah, progression sure, sure. Um, it's just because I'm bad and I I died after right? <laughs> yes. early on. Well, there was a clear end. Uh, yeah. That's the cool thing, and and that's also what what we wanted out of countdown is a, uh, it's a mode that tells you, that's it, you're done, yeah. you you're finished, you can play again, but this is a clear moment to stop, yeah. um, and not asking you, do you want to play again? Do you want to play again? Uh, so um, because that's you know if you if you don't do that, then uh, then you know some people will just stay where they are because they are never provided an opportunity to stop and think where do i go now right uh, so again come down is really this flying i do that then i fly out i'm back at the boo now i can think again what i want to do next yeah um but then let's talk about that thing that we touched upon the story <laughs> yes because this is exciting you're getting back into the story and in a pretty major way. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, when we when we started thinking about the next seasons and where the story is going, um, we we felt like our job was not completely done with the Phalo arc. Uh, and I think uh, a lot of people in the community would agree with that. Uh, so, so it was clear for us that this is the event we want to build upon. Right. Uh, we want something, even though a year and a half happened for all, for us players, for your agent, it is immediately after. Right. You took down Fela. Uh, uh, spoil, spoiler alert. Spoiler for huge season huge, four yeah. for content that is a year and a half old. Yep. Uh, you took down Fela, and immediately after that, what happens? Because it it creates so many questions. Yeah. The events of season four, like Fela was dead, she went rogue and she died. She, spoiler alert, she killed the president, president of the USA. Uh, why did she do that? What, what the hell happened? And you finish the season, season four, and that's it. Yeah. You know, you have all these questions that are open. So we wanted to, to provide the idea that it's not just you that are confused, the player, but it's in this world people, the agents, all the people who knew Phelao, they are also just as confused. Yeah. Like, what happened? And and we can't we can't imagine continuing the story without addressing that, addressing the fact that everybody is wondering what what did she do and why did she do it? Yeah. And, um, and to be honest, like, when we did season four, we, we thought we provided some answers. Uh, when you listen to season four, uh, there are a lot of elements here that, you know, that tell you a bit on, uh, you know, the motivations. But what we've seen when players played it is that it, don't, it didn't really click. Like we, we saw some players and some of our, you know, law experts that actually didn't understand the way we thought they would understand the story. Right. Uh, so, um, so on one hand, that's okay. Well, maybe we could have done a better job. But that's a great opportunity for us because that means okay, we can keep exploring that, yep. uh, and we can we can you know keep digging a bit deeper into uh, into that story and into uh, into all those motivations, mm. uh, and keep building that that narrative. Keep building, even though Phalo is dead, she's still a very important part of our story. Yeah, I think there's a interesting thing there that again we we talked about before recording this about kind of. The the it was the idea as you said that that the the game was finished in quotation marks yeah. as a of course still going but um, that it was it was ending so to speak yeah uh, and that was with season four right yeah so so you know I said about the fact that uh, I mentioned that um, not everybody understood when you know we did season four and there's a there's a bit of a context here on like on, you know, behind the scenes here, putting the curtain a bit on what happened. Uh, and uh, there's two things that happened with uh, with the second year of content for Division 2. The first thing is uh, we knew fairly early on uh, that uh, this was going to be the last year, mm. or that season four, TU12, would be the last uh, the last TU uh, for the game. So uh, So when we approached that year 
uh, the idea for us narratively was, okay, we need to bring this to a conclusion, uh, that story, and especially the events of Warlords of New York. Uh, we need to bring this to a conclusion. Uh, maybe not complete conclusion of everything, but at least something satisfying where you can, you know, put down your controller and feel like, okay, I, uh, this is a, this is a logical ending, and there are still some open questions, but we'll visit that later. Yeah. Um, so so that's one thing, and we started working on uh, on the narrative that way, and that became very clear for us that if we wanted to conclude, we needed we needed to kind of wrap up the failure and the president problematics uh, mm -hmm. because she betrayed uh, and the president is still you know it's awkward I guess you work for the president but the president president is actually the one who hired the black tusk to take yeah. over the country um, so there's that weird uh, position for the division of like we are working for the guy that is actually the enemy of the people mm -hmm. uh, so how do we work for here the people or the government yeah. uh, or the president and um, so we wanted to try to conclude that uh, and uh, and we tried to do that, but uh, the second thing that happened is COVID. Yeah, you might have heard of it. <laughs> yes, and uh, and uh, you know everybody has heard uh, like the impact that it had on some projects and a lot of delays and all of that. But another impact that we uh, had was uh, one of the impacts is uh, voice recording, yeah. uh, and so. When COVID started, uh, or when you know uh, lockdown started, uh, we we realized that the recording studios were going to close, yeah. and uh, so we had to basically very quickly write our scripts and record them before everything closed down. Because once everything's closed down, well, you have the actors at home. How do you record them? Yeah. Uh, you know, the, at the end of the day, some managed to organize a small studio at home and, you know, we all learned to live through lockdowns. But at the beginning, we had no idea. Uh, so we had to prepare with the, you know, the possibility that we wouldn't be able to record any right. voices uh, for who, who, know, who knows how long. So, so we had to very quickly get those recordings in uh, before everything went on lockdown. So we rushed it. Uh, and... Uh, and we rushed it, and so we went. Uh, we went through it, and we reviewed it, and we thought we were in a good place. But normally, you iterate, you yep. iterate a lot, and even after recording, usually you iterate and you re-record because once you have it in the game and you play it, you're like, okay, that works, that doesn't. Yep. Uh, I I got that. I didn't get that. We didn't have the opportunity to do that in this case. So um, so that's probably a, one of the reasons why. Uh, the ending of season four was not as satisfying and impactful as we could have made it right. um, because we just, uh, you know, we had to wrap it up and we had to um, uh, to do it very quickly because of the uncertainty of what COVID would mean for us. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so that's, you know, that's not the case for us anymore because, uh, because now we have, we have solutions, you know, even if there are still lockdowns uh, and hopefully not, but even if there are, Everybody found ways to work through yep. that, so now we can record even through lockdown. So, uh, so that specific problematic wouldn't happen again, uh, and now we can again iterate and, and spend a bit more time and really, you know, polish things uh, yep. the way we would want it to. But back then, we, um, yeah, we couldn't. Yep. So, it's not me trying to find excuses, but that's <laughs> one of the reasons why uh, narratively it wasn't as strong as we would have wanted to make it, especially for a character that as important as Failure. Yeah. But as I said. We are a live game and we can always revisit. And even if a character is dead, that doesn't mean the character is gone. No. I think uh, in general, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting genre because we all know the impact that the pandemic had on on ourselves, like in our day to day mm -hmm. um, and people in whatever industry we're in. Uh, but And we know, as you said, about the all the, the delays and stuff that happened within yep. the gaming industry. So many games got, got pushed. But at the same time, it's not always that you know what actually happened. Like, why are these delays happening? A couple of companies have said why. Yeah. Uh, but but hearing that, like, yeah, it, it's not just always a matter of you know people work from home and you know they, they don't work the same from home. It's when you make a video game, and I'm sure that's true of many other things uh, out there. But I can speak about video games. Yeah. There are so many moving pieces, and and some of them can still be done from home. 
some of them are much harder to get down from home. Yeah. Uh, and if, you know, if one piece is missing, sometimes an entire feature or an entire part of the game yeah. just cannot make it for one small thing. Yeah. Of and course. that can happen. Yeah. But now we're, because of this, we're getting the continuation of the story. Yes. So now we are, now we are back and now this, the story continues. And, uh, and I mentioned the fact that with year four, we want to, we want to focus on stories. So we yeah. want to take the learnings from, uh, from year two. Uh, we are still going to use seasons as a, as a narrative tool, but we've made some changes and improvements, yeah. uh, some pretty significant ones that I'm really excited with, uh, that should help like make it more compelling and more understandable. Yeah. So at the end of season nine, I think things will be way clearer. Sounds good. I'm going to ask the the real like games journalist question. So you announced this is the first update of year four. That implies that there's more coming over the course of the year. That is true. Yeah, that's <laughs> we leave it at that. No, we, we know spec. Uh, yeah, so spec revamp we've said is uh, it's not going to make it in this update uh, for also some of those reasons of, as I said, sometimes there's one piece missing and the whole thing yeah. uh, doesn't click. And, uh, and uh, you know, that's one of those cases. But um, but uh, it's it's almost there, so it will make it very soon. Uh, and yeah, we have you know we have pretty much hinted or confirmed that we have a full year of content. Yeah. Um, you know, as I said at the beginning, when we we took over that team and that assignment, um, we uh, we we immediately worked with the idea of this is for the long run. Yeah. We're going to keep working on the game. We are not making one big hey, come back, update, please come back to the game just to drop it again afterwards. Right. That's really not what, uh, it's not what anybody wants. That's yeah. not what the players want. That's not what we want. Uh, you know, we're we're all passionate about the game and that's why we're here. So yeah. uh, uh, so we uh, we want to keep working on it and we want to keep uh, keep building. Yep, it's our baby. Mm -hmm. yep. It is. Thank you. No, wait. I was going to say thank you, but I'm going to ask one question, which is tricky, I think, in your role, though. Okay. But if if... Do you have any advice for people sitting at home that hear creative director and they hear your description? And we talked about live games and all of that stuff. I mean, so many shooter fans or MMO fans or online fans in general, like they want to work in that space. Do you have any? I've, do you have any uh, tips for? <laughs> it's it's tough because I don't think there's one way, and I think that's exactly my tip. It's there is not one way of, at least in my experience, of becoming a creative director. I'm. I'm a community guy. Yeah. Uh, if you would have told me when I started here that a community guy could become a creative director, uh, I would have said no way. Uh, yeah. Because usually when you're in community, very often you can, you know, you go to marketing, uh, which is fine, but that's uh, that's that's not where my passion was. Uh, so I think it's it's really about um, being curious and trying to understand the craft of how video games are made. Yeah. Uh, talk to people, try to understand how everybody works, try to be a problem solver. And always, especially if you're interested in really direction roles, it's always learning to take a step back and look at everything from a high level and trying to be as pragmatic as you can on if things are the way they are, why are they that way? Yeah. And try to take that from all angles. You need to be able to step in the shoes of the player, step in the shoes of the developer, step in the shoes of you know, the, the business people and the, uh, uh, the, the executives and all of that. You need to be able to understand from every single point of view why things are the way they are, because everything is justified. Yeah. You know, there's, there's nobody evil that wants harm. Uh, everybody, everybody thinks that they're right and everybody is doing things with good intentions. Uh, and uh, and uh, so you need, to, you need to learn to think through the eyes of every single one of those people. Yeah. That's a, that's a great tip. Thank you so much for coming in. Well, thank it's, you for having me. Absolutely. It's been amazing. And I'm really looking forward to trying the update that's either out or not out. Yes. Yeah. And it's been good to just sit with you and chat. It's been too long. The same. It's been, been a long time. It's been, yeah. Yeah. Let's do it again. You're getting nostalgic. Are you, your eyes I'm, glazing over. <laughs> I don't know if I'm there, but yes. I you know, oh, so close. It's weird though, because like we're in another building, so it's uh Yeah, true. It's a fresh start. It's exactly yeah. a fresh start, that's good. Yeah. But thank you again. Let's do this again. Yes. Please.